Welcome to Uprising, Jeremy Scahill. It's great to be with you, Sonali. Well, Jeremy, did you know what you were getting into when you started the journey with Rick Rowley that led you to writing the book and then making the film with Rick, Dirty Wars? Um, You know, visiting places like Afghanistan and Yemen, that there was this huge untold story about U.S. drones and night raids. Did you have any inkling of what you were about to stumble on? Well, you know, for for years, um, I had thought about writing a book um, that I was sort of loosely thinking of as uh, a a title, uh, The War Party, and it was going to be a history of the Democratic Party um, and trying to sort of nail the case that uh, there's very little difference between Democrats and Republicans when it comes to what they call national security policy. Um, And I actually tried to sell that book in 2004, and publishers were telling me that um, uh, it would hurt John Kerry's, uh, you know, campaign for president if I, you know, did a full frontal assault on the Democrats, and I couldn't get it published. Um, and when Obama came into office, uh, I was fascinated by his pledge on the campaign trail to escalate the war in Afghanistan. And of course, you remember, um, you know, Obama was saying that, uh, you know, John McCain, you know, won't won't go into Pakistan, um, you know, to get bin Laden. I will. And he was sort of trying to play it up that he was stronger on terrorism. And so when Rick and I uh, started talking about doing a project together, um, Originally, we were going to do something about Obama's war and uh, and and how he was escalating the uh, the military actions in Afghanistan. And what we saw early on was Obama chose General Stanley McChrystal to be in charge of the entire theater of war in Afghanistan. And McChrystal had come out of the world of covert ops and had spent you know his entire career doing dark ops. Um, so orig- the original idea for it was not that we were going to do some film that was global in scope, but was going to be sort of looking at the role of the Night Raiders, you know, these special operations forces. And um, after we went to Afghanistan, you know, in our film, we tell the story of one Night Raid in Afghanistan, but... Um, we went to probably 12 or 14 uh, different places throughout Afghanistan um, investigating night raids. And uh, and once we determined that the force that was doing these raids was this elite force called JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, and started tracking their movements around the world, we realized that it actually was going to be a film. But originally it was going to maybe be just a series of... 20 to 30 minute pieces about special operations in Afghanistan. And today we know who Jay Sock is in the middle of making your film. You and Rick found out that this thing you had uncovered, Jay Sock, uh, it was blown wide open when they killed Osama bin Laden and that instead of being met with uh, shock, this agency was embraced. Um, but since the, the triumphalism of, uh, over bin Laden's killing has faded a little bit, have JSOC's other unsavory exploits come to light? And if so, have they been met with criticism? No, I mean, you, you know, it was insane. Uh, you know, now we can look back and there's a Wikipedia page for JSOC. JSOC has its own website now. Um, its commander is no longer classified. Uh, and, and but, but it wasn't that way, you know, several years ago. And, and so in the midst of, of, of looking at their role in using cluster bomb munitions in Yemen um, or uh, doing boots on the ground operations in Somalia or running the night raids in Afghanistan, Um, bin Laden is is killed in Abbottabad, Pakistan. And um, and what happened after that, and I know know you remember this well as I do, um, is that they all of a sudden become sort of uh, national heroes. Celebrities. Right, SEAL Team 6. Disney Corporation actually tried to trademark the term SEAL Team 6 to use to make action figures and movies and all of these things. Um, and they really became celebrated. I mean, we we have a, a culture of of warrior worship in the in the United States as it is. And I think now the the you know the the, the hysteria may have died down a bit, but they, the the dominant history is that these forces are the best in the world, and they're you know saving the day for peace, freedom, and democracy. The overwhelming majority of the actions that they conduct on any given week go totally unreported. And I wonder how different their reputation would have been had their cover been blown before they killed bin Laden, had it been revealed what you found out, that they were conducting night raids and uh, these drone strikes that were just killing innocent, ordinary civilians. And in the case of the family that you profile in your film, um, a man who was working with the Afghan police Mm -hmm. was targeted. Do you think we would have had a different opinion of JSOC? Well, you know, in the, um, I I wrote a book that, uh, you know, in the process of shooting the film, it wasn't, it's not a film about a book or a book about a film, uh, but they were both happening simultaneously. Um, But in the book, which is like 700 pages long, it it literally is a coffee table. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, It's not a coffee table book. It's It's literally a coffee table table unto itself. Um, I, I go in deep into the history of of JSOC, and you, you know what happened immediately after 
9-11 is that Rumsfeld and Cheney uh, viewed the CIA as sort of a liberal think tank, which, which to anyone that knows the history of the CIA, that's an outrageous uh, you know, statement. But they, they, they wanted to utilize a force that didn't have to respond to Congress, um, that could operate in secret and would have wide latitude to assassinate people and snatch them. And so JSOC was really heavily empowered, and they started going around the world without even in, in, informing the U.S. ambassador um, in various countries countries or without the knowledge of the CIA and started bumping people off. I think if, if some of the activities of JSOC, where, especially the ones where they were doing operations inside the borders of U.S. allies like Germany, if those had come to light, I think there would have been more attention paid to it. But at the end of the day, and we, we have a, a, a JSOC source in our film and he's a character in my book, um, he says, you know, Congress doesn't want to you know, go behind the curtain and uh, because then there's a moral imperative to do something about it. So what we find is that uh, members of Congress don't ask questions to which they don't want the answers. Right. And so, you know, JSOC largely is able to function because the U.S. Congress isn't interested in confronting the powerful structures within the U.S. military. Uh, and I want to pick up on what you said about Congress um, with the congressional hearing that took place uh, in October of 2013, where a family, a Pakistani family, mm -hmm. came to testify about drone strikes. I believe it was the first time that uh, members of Congress had the chance to meet the survivors of a drone strike by the U.S., mm -hmm. they didn't really get much of a sympathetic ear. No, I mean, in fact, you know, the, before that, uh, there was a, there was a Yemeni guy who was a friend of mine, and I, I, I traveled with him a bit in Yemen, named Faraya al Muslimi. Uh, his uh, family's village was hit in a drone strike, and a number of elders and other people were killed uh, in Yemen, not in Pakistan. Um, and he came to the U.S. and testified on a panel in front of the Senate uh, that included three uh, prof university professors. Uh, so that was from the first from the time. U.S. Yeah, that's my, my okay. understanding. Uh, there were three university professors, and then there was uh, someone who was a colonel in the Air Force who had worked as a drone pilot. It was a, it was a woman. And um, the vast majority of the questions asked that day were asked of the colonel, who was a drone pilot, and the professors who lived down the street, basically, from Congress. You have this guy from Yemen with firsthand experience who had written an op-ed for the New York Times about the his, his what happened to his relatives, um, and almost no questions were asked of him. Then you have, and I, I think Robert Greenwald is very deeply involved with bringing over uh, these people from from yeah, Pakistan. Yeah, the family. And uh, so th they 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 go to a hearing, and it was a House hearing, and only three members of the entire Congress showed up to listen to that testimony. They got outside of community media, independent media, very little attention. Um, I think there was only one major television interview that was done with them, on, uh, and it was on uh, MSNBC on Alex Wagner's show, and they were totally ignored. And, you know, th to me, that, that, that really was indicative of how low we have sunk as a society when we aren't even willing to listen to the people that live on the other side of our, our missiles or our bombs um, and hear their part of the story. And, and, you know, we ignore those stories at our own peril. There will be blowback for this. Yeah. You know, I, I always say to people, you know, people will say, oh, are, are we making more terrorists with our policy? We're not making more terrorists. We're making more enemies. Those people aren't necessarily going to be terrorists. They're people who have a legitimate score to settle. And that's what I've seen in all of these countries around the world in different languages, in different different cultures, people saying the same thing, which is when the Americans raided our house and killed my wife, uh, or they, they uh, bombed my livestock uh, and ruining my, my livelihood, I wanted to put on a suicide vest and blow myself up among the Americans. You know, after a while of hearing that all over the world in different places, it sinks in that what we call our national security policy is one of the premier threats to our actual national security. I mean, I don't think American lives are worth a penny more the non-American lives. I'm not. A, I'm an anti-nationalist. I, I I think we live in a jingoistic society. Um, but you could make a nationalistic case uh, about why the drone strikes make no sense, uh, even if you're just a rank nationalist. This makes no sense for American interests. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say American interests, I don't mean corporate interests because there's a lot at stake for them. They're the only beneficiaries of of these policies. But at the end of the day. Um, it's American civilians who will pay the price when, you know, a subway is blown up or uh, tourists are attacked or kidnapped. And it's not going to be people in the military, the CIA, that do these actions that are going to pay the price. It's ordinary people. What What was it like, Jeremy, to meet with so many survivors of, of U.S. drone strikes and raid, to literally talk to the relatives of people whose loved ones have been blown up by our government um, and killed for no reason uh, in, in their homeland? You know, you travel to all of these different countries. Well, 
you know, I mean, we're, we're on radio, so people can't see me, but I, you know, I'm a white guy uh, with blue eyes. I have a beard. I'm about six feet tall. Um, I look like the people who killed the family members in this uh, um, village outside of Gardez, Afghanistan. Um, you know, the, the, the last Americans they saw before Rick and I went in there were the people that uh, killed five members of their family and then proceeded to dig uh, the American bullets out of the bodies of, of two dead pregnant women that they had killed. And then they blamed it on those families. They said it was, a, you know, it's this sort of racism about it. They said it was an honor killing. Um, and then they started to say, oh, it was the, it was the Taliban that did this. Uh, when in reality, it was these elite commandos from the Joint Special Operations Command. You know, it, it who was, had beards, by the who, way. Unlike yeah, who had beards. The right. They called them American Taliban. Right. I mean, that's what this, this one Afghan guy in the film says, you know, we call them American Taliban. So, you know, I'm sitting there in their house. They could have hacked us to pieces. And, and in their mind, they probably would have been justified in doing so because the Americans came in and killed civilians. Uh, why shouldn't they get revenge on it? And, and, and yet they didn't do that. They uh, sat with us for hours on end uh, in multiple sessions, reliving the most horrifying thing that ever happened to them in their lives. And to me, it was a very humbling experience because uh, Rick and I both felt the responsibility that we had to these families that shared this experience with us um, to make sure their stories were told. And we were, you know, the thing we were most afraid of when we were making this film is that we, we wouldn't be able to do it, that we wouldn't be able to, you know, get those stories out to the world. But, um, you know, it was it was just, it was, um, it's sobering. And, and you see it all, I know you've seen it too as a journalist. Mm -hmm. People who have suffered so much somehow muster up the the integrity um, to share their story on, on, on the off chance that maybe it will make a difference. You met some children as well, a little girl in the film that mm. was pretty... Pretty amazing. And, well, and you know, what, what happened is, you know, so we're, <laughs> we, were, we were with this family in Afghanistan. And just for people to understand the broader context of this, there was a, a child that had been born in the family. And um, they, uh, there were multiple generations of the family living in a kala, uh, which is, a, you know, like a walled compound with multiple houses in it. And, and there had been a child born in the family. And on the sixth day, they were engaged in a naming ritual for the child, where the, the eldest male in the family, um, Haji Sharafuddin, uh, was... Um, going to choose the name for the child, and they were doing the most untaliban-like things. They were, and they're not ethnic Pashtuns. The almost exclusive uh, ethnicity of the Taliban. They were dancing. There were women with head cover off. There were guests that had come in. They had musicians that they had hired, and they are dan You know, they're having this sort of whirling dervish dance, and and and. Uh, and in the midst of this celebration, their house gets raided, and uh, and five people are killed, um, including these two pregnant women. And, um, you know, so we're, we're there some months after this in their compound interviewing probably about 20 members of the family who witnessed this. And you only, you only hear from a few of them in the film. But um, toward the end of, our, of, of the first day that we were there, this little girl uh, whose mother was killed in front of her eyes is standing with her father who survived the raid. And, um, and she's sort of uh, doing this kind of sing song. I thought she was reciting a poem or singing a children's song. And so I'm smiling at her and kind of making faces at her. And, um, and I look and my, my colleague Rauf Ikal, this amazing Afghan guy who worked with us, um, I see him, his eyes welling up with tears. And I didn't say anything to him at the time. And then we got into a car and I said to Rauf, you know, what... Um, what happened there when you were, you know, you had tears in your eye at the end? I mean, we'd been hearing these things all day. He wasn't crying at all. And he said, well, the, the little girl that came up, up to us at the end was listing all of the people who were killed. And, and in our film, you know, we try to recreate for the viewer what the emotion was there, which is that I'm looking at this girl. I have no idea what she's saying. And then only later did we understand that she's naming my grandfather, my mother. She's listing these people who died. How must she have seen me? I'm, she's listing off the names of the dead, and I'm making faces at her. I had no, I had no idea what she was saying. And at saying. that age, I mean, she's at the age where children don't really understand fully what no, death is. No, she's six is years and, old. Right, and, and how many Afghan children? We know now today that uh, some shocking um, percentage of Afghan children have seen uh, a member of their family being killed in front of their eyes, whether it's the whether Taliban, it's the Taliban or, or, or the Haqqani US. Network or the U.S. or, right. or another or a European force. Um, you know, 
in in some parts of Yemen, uh, parents, you know, they they'll they'll refer to drones as kind of a threat of punishment, like the boogeyman or something. They'll say, you know, if you don't behave, I'm going to call in the drones. I mean, it's become it's become so ingrained in the culture that that is this sort of ever present villain that could come and take you away or, or or blow you up. That people are it's become part of the vernacular, which is I mean, think of the psychological toll that this takes on children to grow up with that lawnmower sound of the drones over their heads, knowing that a missile at any moment mm-hmm. could launch. And now this uh, incident that took place uh, that you uh, interviewed the family members about a few months later. Later. These are still continuing. We just heard of the incident in Yemen in December of 2013, mm-hmm. where a, a, a wedding was targeted. Uh, and a number of civilians killed. Human Rights Watch did a report mm-hmm. uh, very recently about that. It, but this was supposed to have been after President Obama put into place supposedly some new standards that would reduce the collateral damage, to use this, the, the, this term, euphemistic term, um, to civilians. Are you surprised at all? that we're still killing civilians in this way? No. I mean, first of all, this is all smoke and mirrors. You know, they're, they're, President Obama said, and his people from his administration say, well, we're going to take the drone program and move it from the CIA over to the military where there's more accountability. I mean, first of all, that's totally not true, that there's more accountability with the military. Um, it's it's basically, uh, it's the difference between old Coke and new Coke. I mm-hmm. mean, it's, it's, it, it's still the same basic product. They just repackaged it a bit. Um, you know, and I, I don't believe for a minute that there is a way of having a drone program where you're not going to be killing a tremendous number of civilians, in part because we're not uh, tracking people using spies on the ground. We're not validating, in most cases, that the people that we're targeting are the individuals uh, that we believe them to be. We're using the metadata that's provided by the NSA. And Glenn right. Greenwald and I did a story you about, just this, wrote about this, but yeah. You know, basically what, ha- what, what we've taken any semblance of a legal process um, and, and we've thrown out the uh, and thrown it out. We've thrown out the idea that terrorism is a crime that should be confronted, you know, using uh, the force of our morals rather than the force of our military. Um, and we're using uh, secret processes in the White House to make lists of people who we sentence to death without charging them with a crime. And then we, we, we find them by the NSA tracking the metadata on SIM cards or handsets or computers. And then uh, the drones implement the execution. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that now is how the United States responds to uh, not just the crime of terrorism, but the possibility that people could be uh, terrorists one day. It's it's pre. I mean, I've talked about this a lot. It's like pre crime. It's like the Tom Cruise movie, the, like Minority Report. Um, that's Obama's policy. So there, there's there's no such thing as accountability for the drone program under this administration. It's totally uh, the same as it's always been. So let's uh, focus on this story for a little bit. Uh, the uh, documents that were given to Glenn Greenwald by NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. You now know that the NSA, which has been spying on Americans and many other people around the world. Um, is also providing this data to uh, the U.S. military, to the CIA, uh, for JSOC, I'm guessing, to go and and have these drone strikes. So they're identifying people not through the good old-fashioned way of informants and on-the-ground intelligence gathering, flawed as that was, but through people's cell phones. Now, can't that cell phone just be handed off to somebody else? How do they know that the person holding the cell phone is the person they want to target, even if we set aside for a minute the immorality mm-hmm. of these extrajudicial well, they, killings? They don't know it. I mean, just to put it in a, uh, in, in, in a sort of non-military realm for a second, if you use Gmail, which I don't recommend, but if you use Gmail, uh, you will see these ads that pop up when you're in your inbox. And... Um, uh, you know, they're trying to target your interests. So if they see that you have been corresponding with a lot of people uh, about a beauty product, um, you're going to start seeing more beauty product things. I mean, I, when I was using Gmail, um, you know, was constantly in back and forth about the CIA and NSA. So I would always have uh, these ads pop up for recruitment at the CIA or the NSA. I mean, just they, fi- they, they're trying to figure out how you think. Yeah. Um, and, and, but I'm, 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 t- I'm bringing this up for a reason. They're building a profile of what they think you're interested in, and it often misfires. Like, I'm not interested in joining the CIA. I'm talking about the CIA for different reasons, but they think that I'm interested in joining the CIA, so they're putting ads on there. In a way, it's similar to what the NSA is doing when they're tracking people. They're building social network profiles. They're saying, well, this SIM card is in touch with this other SIM card, and these SIM cards have both been in this particular mosque in in an area of Pakistan. Uh, Then they were in this restaurant that we know that X, Y, and Z suspects hang out at. Um, And eventually, they use that 
that data to create a profile. And they don't necessarily even know who's holding that SIM card. They just feel like, or they just perceive that this is someone who's around a lot of people that we think are dangerous. And enough of those SIM cards get together in the same place that can activate a drone strike. So let's say that you have, you know, a kid who's father is is in the Taliban. The kid hasn't seen his dad for, for years, but has a weekly call with his dad. So he's on the phone all the time with a Taliban person somewhere. That phone could end up being in the system. And this kid who lives with his mom and his grandparents and whatever is not doing anything wrong, but he has a phone that's been used to contact people from the Taliban. They're not going to say, oh, well, this might be the child of someone. or but No, they're going to say this is a phone that is part of a militant network. And and that's that, I think, is 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 the untold story of where a lot of these incidents happen, like the wedding party in Yemen that you referenced last December, where, you know, uh, all of these people are blown up. It seems from Human Rights Watch findings that all, all of them may have been civilians and, and not, not a single one of them was a member of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or another group. How did they end up triggering that strike that day? Was it metadata tracking? Did somebody have a phone that they used to contact someone? We don't know. Don't and know. the White House won't. They say that every time civilians are killed, they do a review. They've never declassified a review. They've never made it public. We have no idea what structures are in place. So um, some people think that if only everyone in the U.S. knew about the crimes committed by our government, they would demand justice and immediately that. wars would end. But it, your film, even though it's been very well received, consistent with reports by groups like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, there has been more and more light shone on the drone program. Why has that not had an effect? I mean, even forget the government. Why has that not had an effect on public opinion, you think? Well, or I, mean, has it? I mean, no, no, this, it's an important question you're asking. You know, if you look at polls, there's been a, a, a dip in the past several months in support for uh, drone strikes. And the Afghanistan um, war. Uh, and the Afghanistan related, war. Well, yeah. the Afghanistan war now is... is totally unpopular with the majority of the American people. When the Obama administration tried to do their little military adventure in Syria, there was such pushback from the left and the right, um, and a lot of in-between uh, on that. But I, I, you know, while support for drone strikes has dropped marginally in the past few months, um, it remains pretty strong, particularly among self-identified liberal Democrats. Huh. Why is that? Well, part of it is because President Obama has sold people on this idea that he's waging a cleaner war. You know, that, that's why we called the film Dirty Wars, not because we, we think that there's a such thing as a clean war, but as a pushback to the assertion that this is a cleaner war. I also think that there is a dominant view that is fueled by media coverage, by the statements from the administration, by Congress's role in all of this. There's a perception that, um, you, you know, if you want to make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs. And the omelet that, that people believe is being made by the Obama administration is our safety. And yes, no one wants civilians to be killed. You'll hear it all the time. I hear it when I go around the country speaking. People will say, yeah, but I know that civilians die. That's war. But we need to kill them before they kill us. And, and that's a very powerful sentiment that I think exists across large swaths of our society. And at the root of it is, is, is that we are a hyper-nationalist society and believe in radical American exceptionalism, that we have the right to decide certain people have to die um, for our safety to be secured. And I don't even think it, our safety is being secured through this policy, but that's why I think that, that you have this mentality. And then so at the same time then with the Afghanistan war becoming so unpopular and the Iraq war, of course, having been uh, near its end so unpopular, you think that... Uh, those poll numbers are simply based on people realizing that it's just not really benefiting us anymore to be in war? Well, you know, I think I think that pe people are worn out from this. I mean, you know, the, the think of the generation that grew up, you know, that, that's grown up in the post 9-11 world. These are, you know, young people that are being asked to fight in Afghanistan and, and elsewhere around the world uh, that have never known uh, an existence that didn't include some reference to 9-11. Um, you know, there's been over a million Americans that have gone in and out of these wars as part of the military, and then an untold number more as contractors or service or support personnel for the military and CIA operations. I think people are fed up with it. I think people don't don't see any interest in it anymore for the United States. Um, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I tend to think that 
Uh, most Americans, if they knew the extent to which the U.S. was involved with a variety of countries around the world, wouldn't be happy with it and the actual cost of it. Each cruise missile that's launched is $2.3 million. You know, and the U.S. can easily launch, you know, 20, 25 cruise missiles in operation. I mean, uh, t- to me, the, 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 the winning argument with most Americans would be a financial one. I mean, right. it's kind of sad, but I do I actually think that that would be the, uh, the, the best case to make. The, the other issue, of course, is that uh, on the ground wars cost lives, American yeah. lives, and drone wars don't cost any American that's lives. A hu- I mean, that, that's a huge selling point in this. It's a cleaner form of war. We don't have For to us. subject our own... No, 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 that's... Yeah, <laughs> it's a cleaner form of war. We don't have to subject our, pers- our personnel to being killed or shot down or what have you. Um, but it's a false... It, it's sort of a false choice that's presented. People say to me all the time, and it's such a dingbat line, people say, well, would you rather have uh, you know us invade Yemen? As though the only two choices to deal with the possibility of a terrorist attack um, or some other form of an attack uh, is either invading a country tree or using robotic warfare to blow people up that you haven't even charged with a crime. That's part of the problem is that we, we don't allow for nuanced debate in our society. We don't, we, you know, you, you don't see a discussion uh, about alternatives to this policy uh, in the, you know, mass corporate media at all. That actually is a debate we should be having. It's not that I don't uh, believe that there's terrorism or that al-Qaeda isn't a real group. It is. It's a relatively minor threat compared to a, a slew of threats that we're facing. Climate change is a bigger threat. More Americans die of bee stings every year than they do in acts of terrorism. And yet, uh, with the exception of like Monsanto, no one's talking about exterminating all the bees, you know, preemptively. But, um, but at the end of the day, uh, unless we are willing to think of, uh, of alternatives to confronting terrorism, we're doomed to blowback. And, uh, you know, it's not that I don't believe that nation states have a right to defend themselves. It's that I don't believe we're defending ourselves. I don't believe that there is an actual legitimate threat to the national security of the United States uh, posed by uh, people living in rural Afghanistan uh, or in rural Yemen that one day may try to bring down an airplane. There's a way to confront them that doesn't include invading their countries or bombing them. And I wonder how often Americans put ourselves in the same place as uh, Pakistanis, Afghans, Yemenis, etc., who've had their loved ones ripped away from them. I mean, any one of us uh, in that same situation, um, you know, put an NRA-loving gun gun uh, rights-pushing Republican, Mm. um, and, and they would want revenge. Mm. They would want revenge. And the fact that um, so many people have had loved ones ripped away from them, and yet only a small percentage of them actually necessarily act out, and we can only just assume, uh, on that temptation for revenge is actually a miracle. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I... I, I used to agree with that. I, I've i changed a little bit on it mm-hmm. because um, when the school shootings happen, you know, when the Newtown massacre happened, remember when Virginia Tech happened, I mean, we've had all these school shootings. Look at the way our society has responded to those. It's, it's not saying let's go and string up the people that did it. Um, there is this... First of all, there's grieving. There's this sense that this is a horrifying tragedy, and we see the reason why the media coverage is so powerful is because the journalists want to make real the lives that were taken of the children or the teachers who threw themselves in front of a door. We empathize with the victims. We, we see them as our own children. Um, we don't do that in the case of Afghanistan or Pakistan or Yemen or Somalia. We don't think about the you know, people on the other end of it as human beings. Well, you know, you remember after the Boston Marathon bombing, you know, there were three people killed in that bombing. One was this boy who I believe was eight years old, uh, and and another one was a woman who was a student from China. Uh, we heard everything about this eight-year-old boy. We saw that beautiful picture that he had made a few days before uh, he was blown up, um, and, and we empathized with him. The woman from uh, China, uh, President Obama said her name, and there was a blog post that went viral in China called Where You Die Matters. And, uh, and the point of the blog post was if this woman had died in a factory making a product for American consumers, the most powerful man in the world would have never said her name. But because she died in the Boston Marathon bombing, her life somehow was meaningful enough and her death meaningful enough for the most powerful man in the world, President Obama, uh, to mention her name. Uh, We're terrible at empathy in our society if it's not, uh, you know, someone who's directly related to us, either culturally uh, nationality-wise, yeah. geographically. Um, I also think, and, and, and I don't think people say this enough, I think a huge part of why this policy continues is is racism 
and Islamophobia. If Anwar Awlaki, this American citizen who was killed in a drone strike, if his name was Bobby Smith and he was a member of a militia movement instead of a guy who was on YouTube calling for armed jihad, I think there'd be a very different debate in this country. I'm not saying you still wouldn't have people bloodthirsty and saying, ah, bump him off, he's not an American anymore. But I think the fact that, you know, if someone has a beard and they're, uh, you know, and they're a Muslim, I, I, I think that their humanity doesn't count in the eyes of a lot of people. So let's go back to the idea that um, this tactic that the Obama administration has embraced of the so-called cleaner wars in their minds going to somehow solve something. Where does it end? Does JSOC's mission have an end date? Does Obama have a long-term plan for uh, for using this method to end this war? Mm. Um, and if so, is it taking into account the blowback that you were talking about earlier? You know, I, I, I mean, I, it's sort, you sort of see we're, what we sort of see is Obama debating himself publicly. On the one hand, you know, he mentioned in his second inauguration and in this speech that he gave in, in May uh, at the National Defense University, where he for, for the first time confirmed that the U.S. had killed four of its own citizens in drone strikes. In both of those speeches, he said, you know, the U.S. cannot exist in a state of perpetual war. Um, and and yet and I think that he he believes that. I don't think he's just putting some BS out there. I, mean, I think he believes it. Um, but at the same time, he is building uh, an infrastructure, and it's not just him. It's John Brennan, who is the assassination czar, now the head of the CIA. They are building structures that ensure that this will remain a, a central part of how the U.S. conducts its foreign policy around the world. Um, and the next time a Republican is in office who has you know belligerent aspirations like a George Bush or a Dick Cheney type figure... Um, the Democrats aren't going to be able to say anything because they created the infrastructure to keep this going. So uh, on the one hand, I think Obama, the man, wants this to end. Uh, and But his actions as a powerful individual in that position have all gone in the opposite direction. So I think he is talking out of one side of his mouth and saying we want an end date. On the other hand, he's fully empowering the military-industrial complex, the Joint Special Operations Command, and the CIA in a, in a, in a pretty unprecedented manner. Let's talk, Jeremy Scale, about the recognition that uh, the film that you and Rick Rowley made has gotten. Um, it was nominated for an Oscar. Were you surprised? Yeah, I mean, I can't <laughs> say on the radio what my initial reaction was, but it, <laughs> it involved the term holy and then, you know, an, another word that uh, sounds similar to sit. Um <laughs> And uh, which my mom yelled at me about because I tweeted it right after the uh, <laughs> the thing was announced. I mean, when we started making this film, I mean, I come from Pacifica Radio. Yeah. I mean, I started as a volunteer at WBAI um, in New York. I've spent a lot of time here at KPFK. I'm a big supporter and fan of the archives here, the Pacifica Radio archives. Um, you know, we thought that we were going to be taking this film and renting theaters ourselves and trying to, you know, put it out in a community-oriented uh, way uh, that didn't involve any actual theaters, you know, or a theatrical run. Um, and the film surprisingly got into the Sundance Film Festival, and Rick won the cinematography prize there. And there was, you know, it, it, there a sort of momentum started, and we ended up um, working with IFC, uh, as a distributor. And the reason we, we went with them, uh, first of all, you don't make any money doing a documentary. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's even if you get paid uh, six figures for your, your documentary, you are in such huge debt from making it, as I know you know. If you people, break right. even, you're really... Right, right, right. Yeah. right. And we're, we're hoping to break even. It's, I mean, we're all, we all are maxed out on our credit cards right now, yeah. so we're hoping. Um, but so, so it, it, it did well at Sundance. We made this deal with IFC. They distributed the film. And the reason we went with them is they said, we guarantee you that we will put the film in 50 cities. Um, and to us, that was the important thing, that we'd get to travel with it and talk about it. Uh, we had no belief whatsoever that we were going to get a an Oscar nomination. None whatsoever. This was an incredibly competitive year. We had seen a lot of films. There were great films that were made. When we got shortlisted for the Oscar, which means that we made it to the final 15, we were floored. Because this is like, I don't know how many people know this. I mean, in L.A., people probably know this. I didn't know this. It's like running a political campaign. People are lobbying oh, yeah. for the nomination. Oh, yeah. People are this is th it is a system that is rigged entirely in favor of people with money. 
That's the whole thing. So when you're competing against, you know, multi-million dollar ad campaigns and consultants and publicists that are high-end A-listers that have access to all of the, the voters, I have never seen anything like it. I, what I felt like is that we were up against Democratic and Republican institutions, and we are like the Green Party of this. <laughs> like, we, we had a couple of, like, you know, mixers, basically, that we could afford with, like, Costco, uh, you know, cheese platters. <laughs> and then some of the other films had, like, you know, anyway, I don't want to bash so, anybody, but it's... It would have been like the Green Party winning some seats in Congress. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of wild. You know, anything was anything is possible. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the 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 uh, the other night I was at a uh, I was at a dinner um, for the Academy nominees from the documentary division. And it's 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 so refreshing to be in a room of people who somehow managed to make it to the nomination, who share a vision that what peop- what filmmakers should be about is putting a mirror on society and forcing people to confront issues, whether it's culturally, artistically, journalistically, um, about the times in which we live. That's the power of documentary. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Well, the film has um, had its critics. What yeah. has surprised you most about the criticism? And, and has anyone questioned the veracity of your, of your facts? No. I mean, well... There's two questions there. I'll take the yeah, last part of it sure. first. Um, you know, if if people want to challenge something in the film, uh, I mean, I can point them to the book, which is 700 pages and is full of of uh, footnotes. Um, and and there's we have we have a, a heavily annotated script uh, where everything is backed up. There's nothing we put into that film that we didn't have multiple sources on that we didn't uh, run through lawyers and fact checkers and editors and others. So I mean, that, that, people want to say things all the time that this isn't true, or that's not true. But we can empirically prove that it's true if it's in our film. Uh, on the issue of, of critics. You know, I mean, uh, m- much of the criticism of the film has come from sort of the entertainment uh, world. You know, politically, there have been some attacks that are bizarre where people say that uh, because I'm focusing on JSOC, somehow I work for the CIA, which is like, I oh. mean, I mean I've, oh, yeah, there's this, this is a whole, I mean, there's a dingbat factory out there that produces <laughs> these kind of people. I mean, it's like I wrote a 700-page book that talks about the origins of the assassination program and the CIA, and I've done all sorts of work on it. Anyway, so that to me was kind of like, you know, it's like, okay, can you just take five minutes to like skim through the book and see that the whole thing is about CIA and JSOC. Um, But I also have agreed with some of the criticism of the film. Um, A friend of mine, Rouge Al-Wazir, she's a a great Yemeni activist. She and I did an event together in Washington, D.C. after the film premiered there in, in June. And, uh, and 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 Rouge was a big supporter of the film, but she you know she she raised a, a, at at this panel that we did at Bus Boys and Poets in D.C. She said you know I I love the film and I totally support it, but I don't understand why only when a white guy uh, does this kind of work does it get recognized, mm-hmm. and. Um, and and someone in the audience, uh, you know, sort of old lefty, starts yelling at Rude. Oh, you know, he took risks and blah blah. And I said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. And I I said I agree a hundred percent with Rouge on this. I feel uncomfortable in the role that I'm in. It's sort of the magic cracker thing where you have to have you know the white guy make sense of the problems of brown people around the world. And and it's it's such a it, it's it's such an awful reality in our society. And and I've agreed with that criticism in multiple places. Uh, and I I think it's a valid criticism you know we tried we tried to figure out other ways of telling the story and we failed you know to 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 find a different way so we went with the vehicle for telling the story that we that felt most sincere to us and real um but i also think it's a valid i think it's a really valid point Mm -hmm. and anyway and so the vehicle being that the 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 story is about how you as a journalist have uncovered uh and and go through the process of uncovering this i want to actually ask you about this very disturbing moment early uh, on in your film where jay leno during a television interview asks you why are you still alive and and the grim look on your face in that scene just i i I always always think of that when I think of your film. What went through your mind when he said that? Well, you know, at that, uh, uh, you know, Stephen Colbert, when I was on his show, said something at the beginning of it. This was more recently, like, uh, you know, my guest tonight is uh, Jeremy Scahill, and I'm going to be the last person to ever see him alive or something like that. I was on Bill Maher the other day, and he, I think, two or three times on the show uh, said, you know, you're, Obama, Obama's going to kill you or you're going to get in a drone strike or something like that. But but uh, I bring that up because when, when I was on that, this was on Bill Maher's show, when I was on that show, I had not done that many TV interviews before. For, and I had written the book Blackwater, and, and I was right. on talking about that. And um, 
And when Jay Leno said that to me, uh, you know, I'm, you're on a live show that a lot of people watch. Um, I was thinking about my mom who was watching the show and how she would feel hearing that um, because I'm constantly telling her, oh, no, I'm fine. Oh, it's not so dangerous in Afghanistan. Blah, blah. And, and then she, you know, she sees such a recognizable figure as Jay Leno. Um, but I was biting the inside of my cheek. I've actually bit it bloody during that, you know, not to be too graphic, but I actually bit it bloody because I was so uncomfortable um, with him saying it. And, you know, people do get killed. Journalists do get killed around the world. Um, and most of them are not white male journalists who get invited on TV. Shows. And you already know that someone in the U.S. government has your cell phone number because <laughs> yeah, at one point you got a call asking you not to publish. Well, they have your cell phone pieces number too, so now I'm sure they. <laughs> and all of the listeners as well. So it's like, yeah. It's um, and so, what what sort of um, what sort of threats have you gotten? I mean, does is that the price to, that the journalist is supposed to pay for for doing the kind of work that that you and others are doing? That you now thrust yourself by by doing real journalism, and this is launching into a whole different conversation about. Hmm the state of journalism in the United States, but by doing real journalism is the price that you pay, essentially not just raising the ire of the government, but but even getting death threats. Well, yeah, I mean, I get death threats, but I also, you know, the, the U.S. government, it's not like some people may perceive, you know, it's not like... The, the government is going to call you and say, hey, if you don't stop doing this, we're going to bump you off. I mean, that's not that's not how it works in this country. In Mexico, journalists are killed regularly by uh, uh, narco cartels, by paramilitaries aligned with various um, political factions in the country. In Somalia, record numbers of journalists have been getting killed. More than 30 journalists are missing in Syria right now. There's a war on journalism around the world. Absolutely. Journalists are being, I mean, my book is dedicated to journalists who are imprisoned or killed for pursuing the, the truth. And we tell the story of a Yemeni journalist in our film who was held in prison for three years at the specific request of President Obama himself because he was exposing uh, what was a, a, a broadening covert war that the U.S. was waging inside of Yemen early on in the Obama administration. In the U.S., though, journalists are under a different form of attack. Um, our uh, metadata is being tracked by uh, various intelligence agencies in an effort to discover who our sources are. So if we're talking to people from within the intelligence community or the military community and they're giving us information uh, as whistleblowers or as sources that the Obama administration or the Pentagon or CIA doesn't want out, they're trying to find those individuals. Um, and so the danger isn't so much that someone's going to drive your car off of a bridge. The, the, the danger is that you're going to get your sources prosecuted by not protecting them uh, with uh, securing your data. And, uh, I mean, I've been talking about this a lot with people. Journalists need to use encryption. Journalists need to uh, get rid of their phones if they're talking to sources and not bring them into the room. Your phone, your phone microphone can be remotely activated. Your phone camera can be remotely activated without you knowing it. Um, and not if, use Gmail. If, right, right. Well, not, I mean, look, <laughs> I mean, people use, I use Gmail to talk to my family and all that stuff, but, but you shouldn't be using Gmail as your journalistic tool. I mean, it's just, it's, it's idiotic uh, to, to do that. But I mean, is, that's what we know now about the NSA. That doesn't explain why so many journalists who are paid way more than you or I um, have have not weren't the ones doing the work that you did weren't the ones that uncovered what JSOC the the unsavory aspect of JSOC's exploits well all of them are unsavory uh, but uh, so so why why do they work so hard to not criticize the government or, or in other cases, corporations? I mean, look look at some of the deals that have been made uh, by the New York Times and the Washington Post with the White House not to publish stories. You know, in 2004, James Risen, who is a, a fantastic reporter in, in many ways uh, for the New York Times, uh, had information uh, about the NSA uh, that the New York Times editor, Bill Keller, uh, refused to publish because the White House had asked him not to. And only when Risen was about to publish a book that was going to then scoop the Times did Bill Keller uh, publish it. The, you know, the, the, the Times and the Post and other powerful media outlets, I, I think, allow the White House to um, too often scare them with the possibility that American personnel are going to be killed. Um, I don't want to publish something that's going to get anyone killed. Um, and I think we should hear out the White House or the Pentagon or the CIA and let them make their argument as to why we shouldn't publish something. And if it's reasonable, 
I think ethically you can make a decision, but not because they told you to. And 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 they always cry national security. Every single story that's done about the NSA, their line is you shouldn't publish this because it will damage national security. They've diluted their own ability to make a reasonable case. I, I don't I don't uh, believe in publishing the names of you know U.S. personnel, even if I think they're involved with something criminal. Um, I don't believe in publishing their name. There's other ways to handle that. I don't want to be responsible for someone being killed, even if I'm against what they stand for in life. Um, to me, that's a journalistic ethic. But I also, at the same time, don't think we should be intimidated by those in power who will cry national security at every turn. There are things we don't publish, me, Glenn, Laura. Uh, we were having a discussion today about an upcoming story, and we were debating whether or not to publish a certain document uh, wondering if it gives too much information away about an individual. We're going to defer, we're going to uh, default to the position of of, uh, of being more conservative than uh, ambitious to try to get the document out if we think someone could actually be harmed as a result of it. So let's talk about this new media venture that you're involved with, with Glenn, Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, uh, First Look Media, and, and you've started a project called The Intercept with that, and I'm sure many have asked you about this already, but uh, it's refreshing, of course, to see um, um, an institution that is actually hiring journalists rather than firing them at a time when uh, journalism just isn't um, the, the model of journalism that the mainstream model of journalism has failed. Uh, many of us may have known that it was going to fail, uh, but there's currently only two ways to have journalism, perhaps the Pacifica way mm -hmm. and maybe the corporate sponsored public broadcast way like PBS and PR. And then you have essentially what uh, mainstream media does with um, just full blown mm -hmm. ads and, and lots of ads. How is First Look going to chart its course? Um, because no matter how rich somebody is, their pockets aren't um, bottomless. Right. What's it, what is a sustainable model that media can take that a new media venture like this can, can, can find out or explore? I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I mean, Pacific also is in trouble um, financially, and, and, and it's a, you know, it's, it would be terrible if, uh, if somehow Pacifica didn't exist anymore or this radio station. I mean, it's, you know, I think all of us that care about these stations, these Pacific stations, are trying to figure out a way to keep them alive and on the air. Um, it, because it's not just about the content. It's about what these places represent in our society. And the, the, the existence of uh, media entities that are entirely funded by the community, if we, if we lose that, um, then corporations win. You know, these are public airwaves that you and I are talking over right now. Um, and yet, if, if Pacifica were to go down, that would mean that they're entirely corporate airwaves. NPR is, is corporatized now. It's, you know, it's McDonald's and it's, a, you know, they, they use the underwriting to say, you know, instead of a commercial. Um, even though we, this, our organization, we're in an incredible position because Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, is, is personally financing this project because he believes in it. It's not he's not just the financier. He this is his main thing that he's doing now in life. And 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 uh, you know he's he is the person who is m most commenting on our internal discussions. He is involved with everything, not as a micromanager, but as a guy who's excited about building a, a media outlet. So we're you know we're fortunate to work with at, at, at least now at a place with resources. Um, must be refreshing after Pacifica. <laughs> it's yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I spend you know people. It's funny when people people have no. Some people have no idea what it means to do work where you're going internationally. I mean, the amount of money you have to raise just, just to get in and out of a place, alone and it's is right fifteen hundred dollars. Right. Yeah. And uh, and I spend. I, I would av I, I would estimate that. Um, you know, when I left Democracy Now! officially in like 2005, from then to now, I probably spent on average two full months a year fundraising, just begging for money, writing grant proposals, ask people. I was never on staff at The Nation magazine. I, you know, I had a fellowship that I, and I had to raise my own funds for it. Um, so I'd, I would spend two months of a year, you know, doing that. And a lot, you know, I know other journalists, filmmakers, that, that's a big part of how people are doing the, the work they want. That's not sustainable. It's not sustainable to have to spend two months a year begging people for, money. We have to figure out alternative ways of uh, financing serious independent journalism. Th that's why I come back to the Pacific thing. If it goes under, 
And I'm not saying it's going to happen next week or something, but if it goes under in the next 10 years, um, that would be a devastating blow because then you'll have a generation of, of young journalists growing up without understanding that there was a model for how to have a, a media outlet that appealed to the community. That That's what we would be losing there. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought up how difficult it is to be an independent journalist. Uh, you know, you have outlets like the Huffington Post, on the other hand, which their model is essentially to not pay journalists, um, uh, aside from their, their skeleton staff, or to not pay writers. Well, that, um, that's, I mean, I think that's, yeah, they're, they are the bloggers, the people that are creating most of the content there. There's been, yeah. you know, huge struggles there. I mean, another thing we're, you know, we, that's very important that we're talking about right now is how do you also build uh, diversity among, you know, your organization? Um, and that's something that that's the, one of the primary things Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras, and I are focused on right now is how we, as we do hire more journalists, how do we ensure that we have uh, voices that represent a diverse range of cultural, uh, political uh, uh, views and voices and, and, and trying to focus on having people from marginalized uh, 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 or excluded segments of society be given a prominent voice. And, and so that's, that's what we're spending a lot of our time doing now is, is looking at the work of a wide range of, uh, of young journalists and experienced journalists alike. Mm-hmm. Right, because, um, you know, you, uh, you, otherwise you end up just hiring privileged people who already have privilege or independently wealthy. Not always, but generally that's the pool that you have to pick from. Well, uh, Jeremy... Well, Fanny, and I think young journalists should be given a, given a chance. I mean, even if someone is rough around the edges, I mean, I was rough around the edges when I begged my way into working with... Amy we Goodman, she had were. no right. Of course, we all walk in. But again, coming back to it, where what other institutions do we have besides these Pacifica stations that allow someone like you or me to yeah. kind of walk in one day yeah. and and figure out how to f- you know finesse our way into working on a show? We were volunteers, but but we this was our university, you know, f- for all of this. And I, I want that to be part of what we do at the Intercept too, is to give young people that chance where you know they it burns in their heart, and you're going to give them a chance to do it. Jeremy, I want to thank you so much for joining. Joining us, uh, good luck to you and in, in everything that you that you do. Thank you. Thanks, Sonali, and thank you for all of your journalism over these years and everything you do. Can you do? It?